Puget Sound, as part of the Greater Salish Sea, is one of the largest and most important and exceptional estuaries in the world. Over 100 miles long, up to 10 miles wide, and in some spots, it's over 1,000 feet deep. It's home to 3,000 invertebrate species and more than 300 different fish. The largest anemone, chitin, dolphin, clam, and octopus in the world. Wolf eels can grow to 10 feet long and live more than 45 years. Puget Sound is also famous for some of the most delicious seafood found anywhere, like Dungeness crab, Peng Cove mussels, gooey duck clams, and dozens of oysters. Oh, and we have some pretty good salmon here also. I'm Drew Collins, president and founder of Made in Puget Sound. My nonprofit conservation, education, and research organization is dedicated to informing and inspiring people like yourselves to learn about and protect the stunning, colorful, and important wildlife that live and thrive in our Puget Sound waters for generations to come. There are roughly 4 million people living, working around, and enjoying Puget Sound, but our increasing pollution, growing major seaports, ever-expanding naval and commercial shipping, increased pleasure and other marine traffic, each is taking a toll on our local waters. Increasing toxins and microplastics, pollutants like oil and heavy metals, industrial chemicals, caffeine, prescription meds, all are discharging directly into Puget Sound. Along with increasing acidification and warming waters, all are negative, negatively affecting our local wildlife. Most people really see may not have ever heard of, or even think about what's just below the surface. Through my unique underwater photography and videography, I provide a rarely seen window into our local underwater world. Occasionally my work brings me up close and sometimes rather personal with these beautiful creatures. Although I never touch, move, stage, or harm the animals, they may choose to touch me. I'm going to bring you up close to some of these amazing creatures today in their own environment. This documentary series focuses on the underwater wildlife around Whidbey Island. As the fourth largest island in the contiguous United States, its shorelines are comprised of long sandy beaches, stunning cliffs, shoals, coves, and bays. As I discuss in my book, Puget Sound Underwater, there's an important and direct relationship between our local mountain ranges, major rivers like the Skagit, Snohomish, and Stillaguamish, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and Pacific Ocean. For instance, during their return migration, salmon transport nutrients important for wildlife living far up in the Cascade Mountains. Their decaying carcasses provide nutrients for eagles, deer, bear, the trees, and tiny organisms, and much more. Marine and shorebirds like rhinoceros ocelots, carry fish to their nests far inland, also transporting nutrients, nutrients that support our wildlife. This is what makes our estuary so unique, which desperately needs our help. The nutrients within the delicate food web supports not only our endangered salmon and orca populations, but all of our underwater wildlife. Every species depends on the health of our waters. This spot in particular, Keystone, is one of my favorites. With its close proximity to the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Pacific Ocean, its extreme winds, massive tidal exchanges, and strong currents, it's teeming with life. The jetty is a long span of gigantic boulders, resting on the sloping, sandy bottom, plunging to nearly 80 feet out towards the end. Covered with beautiful coralline algae, and obscured with thousands of very large plumose anemones. As the largest anemones in the world, they can grow up to four feet tall and can live for hundreds of years. They may be white, red, or orange in color and provide many species protection from currents and predators. Along with the plumose, in recent years, green urchins have taken on even a larger, more ominous role. Researchers have been studying the relationship between green urchins, bull kelp, and sunflower sea stars for years. 
Since the onset of sea star wasting disease a few years ago, this relationship has been severely out of balance. Basically, sunflower stars were the apex predator that kept the urchins, which are voracious predators, in check. Without these sea stars, urchins have been dramatically reducing the bull kelp populations. Now the kelp beds are under serious stress. Speaking of predators, one of the largest predators of Keystone, a member of the Greenling family, is the lingcod. It can grow to five feet long. They either rest on the sandy bottom or hide within the boulder enclaves awaiting their prey. They have sharp teeth and males can be quite aggressive, especially when guarding their egg mass. Oh, and you may be wondering, how do they keep those teeth so clean? One of the smallest predators of Keystone is also one of my favorite animals in the world and can be found here, the tiny Pacific spiny lump sucker. Although only found in a few spots in all of Puget Sound, Keystone is one of them. Very little is actually known about these adorable little creatures. Usually smaller than a golf ball in size, they can get up to five inches. By the way, size can and does matter underwater. They feed on the algae that grows on the rocks and kelp. Typically they don't swim, rather they hop or walk along the smooth surfaces. Occasionally though, I'm lucky enough to get a shot or two of them swimming, if I can see them at all, that is. Very colorful and easily identifiable by its conspicuous vertical red bands, usually six of them, along its body is the painted greenling. It has a prominent elongated snout and large eyes. They typically rest on the bottom, but their curious nature seems to bring them near me as I explore their environment. May grow up to 25 centimeters, I often find them within the plumos, but occasionally out on the rocks as well. On rare occasions, I may capture a shot of one swimming directly in front of me. Black, brown, copper, and quillback rockfish regularly inhabit this area. They prefer to amass in large schools, hovering in the current above the plumos. They're an interesting species. Many don't reproduce until they're 15 to 20 years old, which is why we need to carefully control overfishing. Some species of rockfish can live to 50 to 75 years old, and some may live to well over 150 years old. That means there may be a rockfish living and swimming around Puget Sound when Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States. A fairly rare species of rockfish in much of Puget Sound is regularly abundant at the Keystone Jetty, the small Puget Sound rockfish, which only grows to about six, feet, six inches. They'll congregate in schools and remain near the safety of the boulders. Note the very large eyes, definitely a Puget Sound rockfish. Although there are upwards of 40 different sculpin species found in Puget Sound, the most colorful is the long fin sculpin. Somewhat rare, but regularly spotted here. They can grow up to six inches and are incredibly elusive. They quickly dart away before I'm able to get close enough for a shot. In my years of exploring the underwater world of Keystone, I've only been fortunate enough to get a few shots. Note how well they blend in with their background. The last time I checked, there are around 89 identified nudibranchs in Puget Sound. I'm only featuring a couple of my favorites in this section. Many more will be discussed in part three, Possession Point. The colorful opalescent nudibranch can grow to nearly three and a half inches in length, while the colorful cockerel's nudibranch rarely reach one inch. Their orange long papillae are a very distinctive feature of this nudibranch. The pilings are only a few meters down the beach from the jetty and are a totally unique structure in Puget Sound. From the surface, they appear rather bare and useless, but just beneath the surface is a whole world of active and amazing Puget Sound life. 
In a bit shallower water, this old dilapidated military dock has a somewhat different seascape. It's much more exposed to the strong currents flooding and ebbing through Admiralty Inlet twice daily. On occasion, I've been diving in and around these very tall pilings, while strong currents swell below and robust winds howl above. This could make for a somewhat chilly feeling. All I'm able to do at that point is hide behind a piling to not get blown away by the current. The pilings are covered thick with an abundance of beautiful large and small white plumous anemones, giant acorn barnacles, kelp, hydroids, bryozoans, sea stars. They're stunningly beautiful and like so much of Puget Sound, very colorful. Various species of crab, sculpin, gunnel, snail, and more live within, explore, and make refuge within these massive clusters of life. Tube snouts, a long skinny fish with an elongated tubular snout, hence the name, can grow to nearly eight inches. Schools swim through the pilings regularly in search of food. They seem to prefer the protection provided by the pilings versus the more open waters of the jetty. Occasionally, a juvenile wolfhill can be spotted making its home within a hole in one of the pilings. As adults, they have relatively poor vision. I'm not sure if this is the case when they're young. Of the three spots in this series, Keystone is the only one I regularly see wolfhills at. As I mentioned earlier though, they can grow to 10 feet long and live to be 45 years. Fabulous animals. Puget Sound is home to the largest octopus in the world. The giant Pacific octopus may only live about three years, but in that short lifespan can grow to nearly 22 feet in size. With extreme luck, giant Pacific octopus may be spotted out in the open during the day, taking a nap. I've never encountered this before at Keystone, they're susceptible to predation from lingcod, orca, and other predators during the day. So they're usually in the safety of their den during daytime hours. Octopuses spend about 20 hours a day resting or sleeping in their dens. As one of my favorite animals in the world, I've spent years photographing, studying, and learning about them and their unique behavior. You can learn much more about octopuses from my article on my website, solitary, formidable, endearing. And watch the video that I shot right here at Keystone. There's so much more wildlife within the cold waters of Keystone. I can only address a few in part one. Many varieties of shrimp, crab, worms, dusters, and more. In the next part, I'll present a very different group of animals that reside in Deception Pass. My goal is to introduce you to what's living and thriving in our underwater world, just below the surface. Hopefully you may take some time and learn more about what's down there. Help save our unique waters and help save our unique wildlife. Okay, on to Deception Pass.